Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motors Studio, here's Steve Jones. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury, Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15, almost wharf online at sunburymotors.com. Ford, Kia, Hyundai, the best in new inventory, all with great warranties. Great pre-owned inventory with the Sunbury Motors guarantee, just in case the budget says that's the direction you have to go. And a fabulous service department with terrific technicians to back it all up at Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Kia, Routes 11 and 15, Hummel's Wharf, online at sunburymotors.com. Our play-by-play call of the day, history in Los Angeles last night. Looking for James, he's got it. Coming to the end of the third quarter, LeBron James, a shot in history. LeBron stands alone. The NBA's all-time scoring record now belongs to LeBron James. Westbrook with it. Give it to LeBron at the right elbow. LeBron, one-on-one against Kenrick Williams, backing him in, turns, shoots, scores! There it is! All hail the new king in town! Young and old, gather round from one iconic Laker to another. The king, LeBron James, has passed the captain! First call by Brian Anderson on TNT, second call on ESPN LA 710. Uh, LeBron James... Uh, we all know that Kareem went to UCLA, had to play all the way through. First year freshman, were ineligible. Then he played three years at UCLA. But LeBron James actually broke this record in fewer NBA games, and it's a record that may not be broken because a of the longevity it takes to get there, and b with load management, you may have guys that may play as many years but not as many games, and. That cuts down, obviously, in the chance to get the number of points. All right. Very pleased to bring in from Football Morning in America, NBC Sports, Peter King. Welcome, Peter. Great to have you back. Steve, how you doing? Doing great. How about you? Everything is going fine. Thank you. Good. Uh, good, good to be out in Arizona and covering the game and uh, getting ready for it. Absolutely. Uh, so let's start with this. The ride along this year was with Nick Sirianni. When did you come up with this idea a few years ago to do this? Jeez, I don't remember. I know that the first time I did it, I did it with Doug Peterson five years ago. And I knew Doug pretty well. And I just wanted to do something that was really a little bit different. And... So, Steve, as you probably know, in the media today, what happens, honestly, is that these guys are getting hit from everywhere at all sides. They, they've got to say no to a lot of people, unfortunately, uh, you know, in the media because they just don't have time. Right. And so I just thought, what better way than to essentially say to them, hey, listen, I'll ride in the car with you. You have to ride to work anyway. And by the time you get to work, I'll get out of the car. You'll get into the car. Or you'll get, you'll, uh, you know, get out of the car and go into your office. And that's it. It's over. Your responsibilities are over. And so, you know, I just thought it was the easiest thing and it did turn out to be very easy. And I, <laughs> although, <clears throat> you know, it isn't altogether easy all the time to find somebody to do it, I think now, like when I first asked Sirianni a couple of weeks ago, he said, oh, yeah, I saw you did that with Doug Peterson. So, I mean, now I think some guys actually 
have seen it and are used to it, so it's not like a shocker to them. A guy like Andy Reid, you've talked to a number of times, so you have built a rapport with him along the way as reporter and coach. Nick Sirianni is a relatively young coach, so you probably don't know as much about him. So what did you learn on this ride in that maybe you didn't know before? Steve, I, one of the things, this is one of the best things I've ever learned on one of these ride-alongs, that, because I always try to talk to them about the people in their lives who are important to them, um, you know, basically who are important to them in uh, getting them to where they are. And the two biggest influences in his life are a small-town high school football coach in far western New York, his dad. Yep. And the other one is his college coach at Mount Union of Ohio, which mm-hmm. is a Division three power. And, you know, he must have talked about Larry Karras for ten minutes. He just, you know, all the all the lessons he's learned from him. And so I just got this thought, Steve, that, that I think real football coaches and real football people would truly appreciate, and that is that, I mean, when you think about it, think of all the great coaches who didn't go to Alabama or start their career at Clemson or, you know, get a huge boost early in their career at Penn State. You know, I mean, Nick Sirianni goes to college at Mount Union. You know, his first job is at a position coach at Mount Union. And then he goes all the way up to Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And so, I mean, you know, this is a guy who really learned the absolute basics of football, who's going to be coaching in the Super Bowl on Sunday, who really didn't hit the big time until like 12 years ago in terms of, you know, a job that you would think, okay, now you're really kind of on the trail. You're on the road to being a big-time coach. And just think of how many people, if they read this, would think that, wow, if Nick Sirianni can do it, I can do it. When uh, part of what was interesting about that was the ability of his coach at Mount Union, and they have won a billion national championships. Uh, yep. as, as anybody who follows the sport knows, they're just dominant beyond words. But he, he told them, players, players, players. Yeah. And it's amazing how he went from, I want to show everybody how smart I am, to actually being smart because it was about players, players, players. <laughs> Hey, you know, the greatest part of that was really that, uh, you know, when Larry Karras, who, you know, remained a great influence of Sirianni's even after, you know, they weren't together anymore, when Larry Karras went to see Nick Sirianni when he was the offensive coordinator at Indianapolis, and he goes, let me see your play sheet. Where's the plays for number 13? (laughs) And that's T.Y. Hilton. And yep. that was far and away their best offensive weapon <clears throat> a couple or three years ago when he went to see him. And so I think that was a great lesson that Nick Sirianni learned and why I think, you know, getting A.J. Brown to pair with Devontae Smith, you know, and, uh, and Miles Sanders has been a godsend for the Philadelphia Eagles and for a coach who wants to make sure that you always try to put the ball in the hands of these immensely talented players. Right, no question. You also wrote in the column this week about the officiating part of it and the ability to take care of simple first. And I know Roger Goodell addressed officiating today because obviously asked about it, especially after the uh, championship games. What's been your thought in talking to, to people along the way about officiating within the league, which obviously the greatest these great athletes are playing it at such a fast pace? I think it's only a matter of time before the NFL goes to full time officiating. Yeah. And I don't think it's necessarily going to make officiating significantly better. It might be marginally better, but you know, to me, full time officiating, everybody you know, is desperate for that. Uh, 
and it certainly won't make officiating worse, but it's not a magic pill. And officiating is just too hard to think that by uh, making one or two quick changes that, that that's really going to fix everything with officiating. So I think full-time officiating is coming, I don't know, two, three years down the road. But I'm not sure that they're going to adapt the Sky Judge, which I think, uh, as I wrote this week in my column, <clears throat> you know, there are right now two outside influences, the New York Officiating Command Center and yep. the replay official upstairs in the press box at every NFL game who have a direct line into the ear of the referee. And it's the exact same thing uh, that the Sky Judge would have, a line into the ear of the referee. The only difference is that the Sky Judge would have the ability literally to throw a flag. <laughs> and, you know, so, but I think that it's just a duplication of duties. And so yeah. I think you will see full-time officials, but I don't really think... Uh, the sky judge is really going to get a lot of uh, a lot of consideration. Uh, I'll preface this question about Tom Brady this way. A f- years ago, uh, Billy Packer, who just passed away, he and I were speakers at a dinner. I'll let you guess, Peter, which one went last. And <laughs> so, <laughs> and we were we were chit chatting just about the business, and we were talking about interviews. And he said, "You know, Steve, what I like to do." is I like to think about a question that somebody has not been asked before. Yeah. I mean, Brady's been at this 23 years. Can you think of any question that you can possibly ask him that he has not been asked before? I can't. I mean, if you gave me an hour, I might be able to do it. Yeah. But, you know, the, the thing, and especially with Brady, you know, who I've talked to a lot in my life, um, the thing with Brady is that you're much better with Brady being very granular. Asking yeah. him, tell me exactly why you picked uh, Julian Edelman on this third and 16 play because Edelman said he was the third option. So why did you go to Edelman on this play? And right. then Brady will be like Tiger Woods talking about his approach shot uh, on on the eighth hole at Augusta. You know, he will give you some great detail and really talk about the inner game of football. Um, and that's when he's best. He's best when he's in his comfort zone of talking about the details of football. He's also very good. Like I once said to him, this was in 2017 after the Atlanta Super Bowl, <laughs> and, you know, he was telling me about his plans for the off season and what he was going to do. And, and you know, a lot of it was, you know, the care and feeding and conditioning of Tom Brady. Mm-hmm. And I said to him, you know, don't you ever really want to go out and have nine beers with your friends, you yeah. know, and just get, just get drunk one night? Wouldn't that be fun? He goes... <laughs> I've done it before, and this, believe me, you know, playing in games like this is a lot more fun, at least for me. And so I think, you know, lifestyle questions, physical questions, all that stuff is good. Probably not going to get him to talk very much about, hey, so what's your relationship with Bill Belichick really like, you know? So it's one of those things that you just have to kind of be smart and think about it. And um, but he, you know, he's pleasant enough. He just isn't the most revealing guy most of the time. I mean, normally I'll I'll admit to everybody my standard when doing, for example, a pregame show with a coach, you know, especially a football coach, where they've done a press conference, they did a quarterback club, they did the talk show with the fans, things like that. I try to think of a question they haven't been asked that week. Right? Yeah. To be honest with you, uh, and that's usually the standard I'll have. Ha- what weren't they asked this week? And then I'll lead off with yeah. that. Uh, That's fantastic, but, though. No, and it, well, I'll get, like for example, in the Rose Bowl, I asked James Franklin first question. 
what's the responsibility everybody needs to take on cover zero and that they need to recognize it and what kind of breakdown happens if one guy misses it? That was the opening question. That's good. So, I like that. Well, no, that's because that's because Utah played a lot of cover zero. So, yeah, uh, that's good. So, one final question, and I'll let you go because I know you're, you're doing a thousand of these, and I appreciate the fact that you included us. Uh, the Hall of Fame vote. When you sit down, and you start running through, and of course it's a long process, right? What are your personal standards when you're looking at a Hall of Fame vote? And you know, because obviously it's going to be revealed, and you're not supposed to reveal your vote till later. So, what are your right. standards? All right, Steve. So here's the way I sort of look at the Hall of Fame right now, and the way I look at how we should consider Hall of Famers. Paul Zimmerman, who the late Paul Zimmerman, who was kind yep. of my mentor at Sports Illustrated, yep. always used to ask us, everybody in the room, like if somebody would be reeling off stats, he would say, Jesus, can we please talk about the guy as a player, not you know his statistics, which everybody can look up. What did mm-hmm. you think of him as a player? What made him good? What made him hard to defend if he was a receiver? You know, what made him hard to beat if he was a corner or whatever, you know? And what I always really, really valued um, about, you know, the jobs that we all have is that, look, you know, like, for instance, a big person this year was Zach Thomas. Mm -hmm. And so we already had our meeting, and I know who made it and I know who didn't. I don't mean to to be a jerk about this, but obviously we're sworn to no. secrecy. No, no, no. So, that's why yeah, I prefaced. So, that's but, why I prefaced it the way I did. You're not supposed yeah. to. Yeah. So, so basically, you know, I, <laughs> when considering guys like Zach Thomas, you know, I think back to two things. I think back to games I covered that he played in. Number one, and number number two, I think back to people who coached him and what they said to me over the years about him. Mm-hmm. And I can just tell you, Jimmy Johnson valued Zach Thomas the way he valued Michael Irvin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, because obviously, you know, Jimmy had a real thing, you know, when he got to Miami, he had a real thing for the kind of player that Zach Thomas was. Ended up cutting Jack Del Rio because he had Zach Thomas uh, and all that. But, but anyway, I try to think of those things. And then I always try to think of, okay, what did I think when I watched him play? And yeah. then, obviously, you factor in the, the stats and everything. And look, I am not the same as the other 48 voters. And you know what? They are not the, every single one of them will think differently about players. Like, for instance, of all the wide receivers, I think Andre Johnson is head and shoulders above uh, Reggie Wayne and Torrey Holt. They're mm-hmm. the finalists this year. And I even think Heinz Ward is uh, is right up there with, with all of them because he's the greatest blocking wide receiver of his era. And so I think about things like that, and I try to have an open mind. But I want to have, Steve, a strong opinion when I walk into the meeting. I want to feel strongly about the guys who I like and the guys who I have some questions about. But I don't want to be intractable. I want to be able for somebody to convince me that maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm being a little bit too hard on this guy. Or maybe I like a certain guy a little bit much. You know, like, for instance, I love Devin Hester. And yeah. I love his, his case. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of people who think, well, he didn't play that many snaps because he was a returner. Does a guy like that belong in the Hall of Fame? And so there are those kind of things that you have to consider. It's really kind of a, it's a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle, and it's really, it's kind of fun to be involved. I, I've really enjoyed it over the years. And again, everybody has the different opinions. I'll, I'll give everybody one quick example, and I know I've cited to the, you, this to you before. When, when Ira Miller had a, a vote, uh, he came into the booth one day because he wanted to talk to Jack Ham about Ray Guy and whether he should yeah. be a Hall of Famer. And then Ira said, 
He says, I know. He says, but, you know, he says, like Peter points out, he's re- referring to you, he says, about Gerald Wilson. You know, and, you know, and I'm just sitting there as a fly on the wall. I'm not going to sit here and interrupt that conversation. But it was just interesting. Everybody has yeah. their own take on what they saw and what they, you know, and what they went through. I always had this feeling that poor Gerald Wilson, if you look up both those guys on Pro Football Reference and you compared their careers down to all the awards and honors they won, you would be really hard-pressed to pick Ray Guy over Gerald Wilson. It wouldn't be terrible, but they're almost like a coin flip. And I've never heard one person make any sort of case for Gerald Wilson for the Hall of Fame. That's why I... I, you know, I, you know, a lot of times emotions get involved, and opinions of people like John Madden get involved, yeah. you know, who's very, very widely respected. So, you know, you, I just try to do the job and try to be as honorable about it as I can. And you do always have. Thank you so much for the time today. Appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the week because I know it's going to be filled with a lot of work, but also you will find a way to enjoy it. Steve, really appreciate it. Always love being on with you. Thanks. Peter King joining us from Football Morning in America and NBC Sports. Before we take a break, anything from the Bitterness Cafe? <laughs> um, no, but I- I'm glad to hear that NFL officiating full-time is only a matter of time because I think – it won't solve everything, but I think that would be a, a big help. Well, yeah, I guess. Um, I mean, as Peter said, it won't make it worse. Um, but I agree with him. It'll only make it marginally better. Um, I know I was whenever I talk about I was asked this morning, I spoke to a club this morning, and they asked me about college basketball officiating. And I said, look, here's the problem. The problem is that the three guys you're going to have at tonight's game, and I don't know who the three are tonight, okay, but the three that you have at tonight's game, I said, who knows how many of them worked last night? I said, my guess is all three of them worked last night. I said, they can do as many as four to five games during the course of a week. And I said, why do you get to the tournament and the officiating seems to get a little bit better? I said, two reasons. I said, obviously, the cream of the crop. I said, but you you, you are talking about 30-some-odd games on the, you know, on the opening weekend, so it's not all just the cream of the crop. But they get to a city on Tuesday night for a Thursday game, and they sleep. And guess what they do on Wednesday? They sleep. And then they do the game on Thursday, and the game's over. They go back, and they get sleep. And they don't have another game till Saturday in the same city, which means on Friday, what do they do? They sleep. I said, suddenly out of nowhere, they're getting rest. Right? And believe me, that's a big part of this. Suddenly out of nowhere, college basketball officials in the month of March are getting rest. I can tell you right now, there are a lot of guys right now in college basketball Matt, that are just tired beyond words because they're going from one city to the next and just trying to get as many games in as possible and make as much money as possible. And I don't blame them for that. Yeah, I totally believe it. I mean, but I don't blame them for trying to get as much money as they can out of it. But that is one of the big issues to me with college basketball officiating right now at this time of the year i think from mid january on it be, does be a fatigue does become an issue despite the fact that these guys are working hard and doing everything they can to be in the best shape possible Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. In Sunbury, Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15, Hummel's Wharf online, sunburymotors.com. Ford, Kia, Hyundai, best in new inventory, great pre owned inventory with the Sunbury Motors guarantee. 
And a great service department that backs it all up with fabulous technicians. All at Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Kia Routes 11 and 15, Hummel's Wharf online at sunburymotors.com. So we're talking about officiating at this time of the year, and they're independent contractors. So this is about college basketball officiating, not obviously pros or college football. So I'm going to give you an example, and it's only to cite an example, uh, because I think John Higgins is a good referee. He's good. But this is his schedule, and I took this from KenPom.com, which has a rating of all these guys. Then I'll get into the number of games that they do. John has now officiated 67 games this year, which is not, which by the way is not the most. But here is his schedule. This is in a nine-day span. Saturday, January 28th at Stanford, California. Sunday the 29th at Purdue. So he had to go from Stanford, California to West Lafayette on a Saturday to a Sunday. Right? One was a 10 o'clock game at night, Eastern time, on Saturday at Stanford. It was a noon game, 12-15 at Purdue the next day. Then the next day on Monday the 30th, he then went from West Lafayette to Austin. to do Texas and Baylor. On the 31st, the next day, on a Tuesday, he made his way from Austin to Lawrence, Kansas, to do Kansas, Kansas State. He then, the next day, on Wednesday, February 1st, made his way from Lawrence to Des Moines, which if he needed to, he could drive, for Drake, Northern Iowa, which was a 9 o'clock game at night. That was a double overtime game. He then made his way on that Wednesday the 1st to Columbus for Wisconsin and Ohio State for a 7 o'clock game. And then finally had a day off on Friday the 3rd before getting to Morgantown for the game with West Virginia and Oklahoma. And after doing West Virginia and Oklahoma on the 4th, he then made his way to Lincoln to do the game with Penn State and Nebraska on Sunday then took a day off and then last night was in Albuquerque at the pit for New Mexico and Nevada that's why I talk about fatigue at this time of the year you had to go from and I'm not saying he's tired I'm just saying it's something to consider you had to go from Stanford Oakland, San Jose okay, and get your way to probably either Indianapolis or Chicago to do a game and then you've got to get to either Indianapolis or Chicago, get a plane and get yourself to Austin, Texas. And then from Austin, Texas, you've got to get a plane probably to Kansas City to get you to Lawrence. And then you can, if you need be, you can drive from Lawrence to Des Moines, but that's not as short as you think it is. Uh, so you probably flew there. And you got to get yourself out of Des Moines and into Columbus. That's eight games in nine days. So this year, Keith Kimball's done 74 games. He did the Penn State game on Sunday with Nebraska. And he's done 74 games. Doug Sermons has done 72. John's done 67. Roger Ayers, 68. Kip Kissinger, who did Sunday's game, has now done 70 games this season. Now, I'll say this. The last game Kip did was Sunday's game. He has not officiated a game yet this week. It was actually the first Penn State game he's done this year. John Higgins has done four Penn State games. Um, Paul Sells has done four Penn State games this year. He's done 56 games. Terry Oglesby, 64. Brian Dorsey's done 59. Ron Groover's done 70. Bert Smith's done 69. Tony Padilla, 70. I mean, now you're starting to see how this all adds up during the course of a week. This is how it's, it's all adding up. Look, and everybody wants the best officials. I mean, Keith is an outstanding... I mean, I, as I pointed out in the pregame, Keith's an excellent official. You know, I mean, he... You know, now, did he foul up the the play with... Um, with Tomanaga on the three-point shot where Tomanaga just the ball slipped out of his hands, he caught it, then shot the three and got it? Yeah, because that's traveling. 
Because what did he do? He guessed. He, he's no way he could have let go of the ball. It had to be hit. The ball wasn't hit. And that goes back to what I was talking about with Peter. It's it's not just doing simple. You have to. You can't guess either. If you don't see it, don't call it. He was emphatic. I mean, and when I say like you, it was tipped. I mean, everybody's looking around like the ball. The like, we're all looking at each other. Kevin Kugler, Jess Settles, Dick Girardi, and myself. The four of us are looking at each other like, what is he talking about? <laughs> now, I'm not going to say it, it's going to uh, change the game one way or the other. I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying that you sit there and you're like, jeez. Got to be a little more. And I, that's why I do wonder. I mean, you're talking about the number of games these guys do. And. I don't know. And I, can I. And I don't blame them. You're being played. You're being paid on a per game basis. This is a way that you know. Let's let's face it. They, you know these guys have other jobs, but you know this is a big part of their livelihood. And let's face it, part of their profession. And I, you know, and if you offer them more money to do fewer games. They're going to sit there and figure out a way to do more games because now they're getting more money, <laughs> so, which is natural for any of us. We'd all feel that way about it. But if you're wondering why in college basketball what one of the issues happens to be, it is the fatigue number. We're here on February the 8th. Keith Kimball and Doug Ser- Sermons both already done 74 and 72 games respectively. There's still another month to go. There's a good chance the two of them are going to be in the mid-90s by the time the tournament comes up, if not near 100. Roger Ayers does near 100 every year. So let's take last year. What were the most last year? Keith Kimball last year did 95 games. Bert Smith did 96. Roger Ayers did 99. Doug Sermons did 90. Those are the top four in terms of number of games done. John Higgins did 88. DJ Carsonson did 79. Uh, Oglesby, Terry did 85. Kip Kissinger did 83. That's last year. 2021. Well, there weren't as many games in 21 because there were so many games missed. Um, with COVID, so there are fewer games. So let's not go there. 20, same thing, season got cut off. So the Tony Padilla, well, Keith Kimball did 106 games. He did 106 games. Wow. And that, you know, and again, there's no NCAA tournament that year. Only the first round of the tournaments were played. He did 106. 2019, Keith did 107. Ron Groover did 101. John Higgins did 101. Kelly Pfeiffer did 101. Let's see, 2018. Nobody did more than 100. Doug Sir, let's see, Roger Ayers did 97. Doug Sermons did 96. Keith Kimball did 99. Mike Eads, who's not out there any longer, 95. Teddy Valentine did 91. Terry Oglesby, 91. Now, I know, for example, I've talked to Ted. Ted told me he's he's really cut back on his on his. Uh, He's tried to be more realistic on his schedule. 
Uh, John Higgins, and I had 2017. John Higgins, 102. David Hall did 100. I mean, this is how many games these guys are doing in a season. 2016. David Hall did 101. Jeffrey Anderson, who's, by the way, one of the best in the business, too. He's done a lot of Penn State games this year. Jeffrey Anderson did 102. Jeffrey Anderson's really good, by the way. I mean, Keith Kimball's really good. Doug Sermons, John Higgins. They're, they're all really I mean, Roger Ayers is good. Kip Kissinger, Paul Sells. I mean, these guys are all really good officials. Right? But even with really good officials, I get concerned about um, this time of the year I, with just all the travel. So let's take, let's. Okay, let's see. Let's check Keith's thing out since he's done. He has the most games right now. I think he has the most games. Does he have the most games? Yeah, it's 74. Is there anybody with more than 74? Ding, 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 ding. No. So right now he's number one. All right. So Keith will start on Saturday, the 21st of January. He's in Salt Lake City. The next day. Not a bad trip. He goes from Salt Lake City, night game, to a Sunday game at 6 o'clock at night. Not bad in Boulder. So he just goes from Salt Lake City to Denver, drives up. All right. The next day, he goes from Boulder, Denver, all the way over to Blacksburg, Virginia. This is, again, a 6 o'clock game on a Sunday in Boulder. So he's got to go from Boulder to Denver after the game. He's got to get a flight from Denver Jeez, I don't know, to Roanoke? So it's probably Denver to D.C., D.C. to Roanoke, Roanoke, something like that, to do Virginia Tech and Duke at 7 o'clock. And then the next day, he goes from Blacksburg to Ames, Iowa, to do Iowa State, Kansas State. And the next day, he goes from Ames, Iowa, to Gainesville, Florida. And the next day, he goes from Gainesville, Florida, to Ann Arbor. Then it's Friday. Almost all these guys have Friday off. Almost all. Okay? Friday off. So now he goes to Waco on on a Saturday, 4 o'clock game. He goes from Waco to Iowa City. These are not the easiest places to get to. All right? I know <laughs> because I live it. All right? Waco to Iowa City for the next day for Iowa Rutgers. The next day, he goes from Iowa City to Grambling, Louisiana for Alcorn State and Grambling State. And the next day, he goes from Grambling, Louisiana to Fort Worth, Texas for TCU West Virginia. And the next day, he goes from Fort Worth to Norman, so he just goes to Oklahoma City, for Oklahoma State, Oklahoma. And the next day, he goes from Norman, Oklahoma City, to Chicago, to Evanston, for Michigan and Northwestern. And the day after, on the Friday, he goes from Evanston, Chicago, direct shot into St. Louis, for VCU St. Louis. And the next day, he goes, on a Saturday, to Clemson, South Carolina, which means he's got to go from St. Louis to Spartanburg, and then drive over to Clemson to do Miami Clemson. And then he flew from Clemson on Saturday. So he's got to go to Spartanburg, who knows where he connects, and gets into Lincoln to do the Penn State game at 4.30 with, with, with Nebraska. And then he went from Lincoln to Lawrence, Kansas, which is that, now that's easy. I mean, that's just a drive. Boom. And he went from there to Winston-Salem last night. Like, this is what he's been... I mean, that's why I worry about the fatigue part of it. Look at... I mean, he's not going from Chicago to Denver to do the Bulls game one night and the Nuggets game the next. He's going from Clemson, South Carolina to Lincoln, Nebraska. Now, this year, I've done a game in Clemson, South Carolina, and I've done a game in Lincoln, Nebraska. So I know where, all, where, where everything is. You've got to drive from Clemson to Spartanburg, get a flight 
that is not going to be direct to Lincoln. My guess is it's going to be Spartanburg to Atlanta. And I'm going to guess... Are there any Atlanta to Lincoln flights? Let's just look here. United, let's just take Delta, right? We'll, we'll take, I don't know what airline he flies, but I'll take Delta only because Atlanta's a hub. How about that? So we'll go there. If I want to book a flight, ding, 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 book a flight, all right? And I want to go from, let's see, Atlanta, okay? to Lincoln, Nebraska. Lincoln. Let's just see. Yeah, perfect. There we go. LNK. Got it. We're in. One passenger. Let's see what our options happen to be. Uh, Please correct the one item indicated. Oh, I don't care. Um, There we go. We'll do that. Good enough. Right. I mean, and this is the way. Oh, this happens to be. Oh, um, I'll come back on the ninth. Yes, there we go. Oh, come back right away. Don't really care how much it costs. Right. And guess what? It's not easy. We'll come back, wrap it up in a moment here on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Okay.